not here to kind of self and promote myself. I'm here to self and promote these amazing lawyers that you hired and to make sure that I'm holding every facet of this institution accountable to creating equitable experiences for them to make sure that they have the right opportunities that's going to position them to make out of their career what they want. Hey everyone, and welcome to Scene at Work, the podcast. It's the podcast where we highlight diversity and inclusion professionals and the work they're doing to help their fellow employees feel seen at work. I'm Natalia Eileen. I help businesses build more diverse, more inclusive workplaces. And today I'm excited to bring to you a conversation I had with a fellow diversity and inclusion professional, DeAndre Carr. DeAndre is the diversity and inclusion manager at Cleary Gottlieb Steen and Hamilton, a law firm located in New York City. Prior to working at the firm, DeAndre received his MBA from the Yale School of Management, where he also worked as the program coordinator for the Afro-American Cultural Center at Yale University. You can read his full bio on our website at cnetwork.com slash podcast. During our time together, DeAndre shared specific insights into his role as the diversity and inclusion manager at a major law firm. He shared some of the triumphs, some of the challenges, and some of the very intricate details associated with working in this space within law. I hope you find this podcast episode as interesting and as insightful as I did. Without further ado, Here's my conversation with DeAndre Carr. All right, we have DeAndre Carr here on the podcast. We're so excited to hear from him. How are you, DeAndre? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm doing well. Um, I have just been really looking forward to this conversation because I know you've been doing some great work and I was hoping maybe we could jump right in with you sharing a little bit about your background and what you're doing now, and then what project you'd like to highlight in this conversation. So my background is in economics and public policy. I actually did my undergrad at Wharton. Thereafter, I did a public policy degree at Cornell. I worked in anti-money laundering and terrorist financing prevention at American Express. And then I went to business school at Yale. And now I am doing equity, diversity, and inclusion work at a very large law firm in New York City. It goes by the name of Clary Gottlieb Steen in Hamilton. We are a traditional Wall Street firm that has a variety of different practices, including mergers and acquisition, uh, securities, capital markets, litigation, both securities and civil, and just anything that you would expect a Wall Street law firm to be doing. Nice. Do you want to talk about a specific project maybe that you've started? Um, We know that you probably have a lot of things going on, but if there's anything that's worth sharing right away. Sure. So I think for me, I think how I think about diversity and inclusion, especially in the context of a law firm, which is a bit different compared to, I think, how other multi-matrix organizations may implement and manage diversity and inclusion. I think with us, the teams are a bit leaner and our goal is to help really integrate an inclusive mindset and inclusive approach in terms of how we serve all our stakeholders. So for me, that's our prospective lawyers, which are law students. I think secondly, our current, you know, associates, which is going to be the pipeline of future talent, uh, the partnership, which is also very important, our clients, and of course, other communities slash pro bono partners that we work with. I think it's very important when you're thinking about, I think any strategy is that you think about who are the consumers of these different facets of the organization and how can we make sure that how we're serving that audience, it's in the most inclusive, it's the most respectful way, and it's, it's in a way where people's difference does not feel hindered in how we're serving that constituent. I think when you think about law firm, obviously there's a lot of focus on goals and targets and really increasing the representation of lawyers and increasing the representations of lawyers within partnerships. I think when you look at partnerships, I think in terms of maybe the African-Americans represented in partnership, maybe it's 1% out of all partners. So the, the legal industry has a lot to do. You know, I think women have experienced some more progress than I think attorneys of color. I think if you look on average for big, big law firms right now, I think you'll see that 
21 to 22 percent of I think full equity partners of law firms are women mm-hmm. uh, I think in terms of minorities you'll start to see anywhere between I think 12 and 14 percent so there's a lot of work that needs to be done and just to contextualize those numbers a bit further, I think when you look at incoming classes, people of color, they tend to, incoming classes into law firms, I mean, mm-hmm. people of color tend to be about, I would let's say 35, 34 to 35% on average of what comprises the first year associate class mm-hmm. and women comprise 50 to 51% of first year associate class. So you can mm-hmm. see that as they progress in seniority, there's a variety of different variables that help draw those numbers down (laughs) and I see my role as not so much increasing or managing the numbers per se but my focus is on managing experience experiences and ensuring that someone's difference does not hinder their ability to maximize their opportunities at the firm I think that's always been I think the hallmark of the diversity and inclusion approach that I employ Mm -hmm. as a practitioner So just to give you a backdrop, so I think in terms of what's really been effective is really driving accountability at the senior levels. I don't think there's any element that is more critical to advancing diversity and inclusion than doing that. And it's really making sure that you have mechanisms in place where I don't want to say that there's some punitive measure when people are not accountable, but the statistics and how those statistics compare across practice groups and what practice groups success with respect to diversity and inclusion look like, I think are being compared and being discussed and talked about. So you can make sure you have the right senior level ambassadors and making sure that whatever the approach is, that the right interventions are happening and that they're happening at the right stages. Um, I think that's just an important approach. Sorry, I don't want to go too much into details because they're very specific to law. <laughs> and I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> but I think that's, to me, that's one hallmark approach that you need to have. I think after the accountability, I think measurement is also extremely important. I think you just need to know what you're measuring in terms of the metrics. I think mm-hmm. for law firm, I think what's really important is the hours, right? So mm-hmm. I think the way law firms think about hours, and that's how the associates report their time. You literally have to, when you're a lawyer, you literally have to document every time, everything that you do for a client. It doesn't matter whether it's a email that takes two minutes or a memo that takes three hours that needs to be documented and recorded because we need to track what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And it's an important proxy for professional development and opportunities. And I think one of the main benchmarks people use to staff you on additional matters. So hours are very important in the context of an associate's tenure within a law firm. So from a diversity perspective, obviously making sure that when you're looking at hours, you look at hours across demographics, you look at hours across demographics within practice groups, and you look at hours across demographics within practice groups, also within seniority levels. It's all, I think, very important. I think oftentimes that is where you can start to uncover, I think, a lot of the issues. Unfortunately, more t- a lot of times, more times than not, it's not just a clear problem, but I think a problem across many law firms, you'll see that people of color are billing less hours than yeah. uh, their majority counterparts. And there's a couple of reasons why that. I think, you know, potential bias in the staffing system. You know, what are you thinking about? What factors are you thinking about to identify the solution to, you know, remedy that? You know, I think a lot of times is, I think some strategies people have used to remedy that is to create, I think, a blind staffing system where instead of, you know, I'm a senior lawyer, you're the staffer, I say I want associate X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. You'll, as a senior lawyer, you don't have that kind of removing that power and the staffer just takes you the most, just gives you the most available person or the person next in line to receive the opportunity. So sometimes people have that. I've seen a lot of law firms have started to employ that type of approach to yeah. help manage the type of subjectivity that could be affecting how people staff matters. I think mm-hmm. that can be important in terms of the billable hours. It's also not just the staff or staffing the matters, right? But also what the senior associate who's over maybe overseeing the matter is doing in terms of assigning work to various associates, right? That's another opportunity where, you know, bias can manifest. I think a lot of times within, I think the professional tenure of associates, it takes a while to really 
nourish the leadership managerial styles of associates. So mm -hmm. a lot of times I think the apparatus is, let me make the decisions that will maximize efficiency mm. instead of really balancing that with maximizing efficiency, but making sure that the professional development nourishment of the team members on my team is also prioritized. I think a lot of times that often is a uh, skewed a bit. Yeah. And of course, the other thing affecting that is, you know, relationships, right? You know, professional services, as I'm sure that you know, are very relationship driven business models and to the extent that you are diverse that creates an additional barrier that prevents you from creating a meaningful connection right, right. so i think also under that model just making sure you have the right, the right the right mentorship i think the right forums for people to raise their concerns i think is also extremely important as well mm -hmm. uh, so I've said a lot. I want to make sure I give you an opportunity to entertain <laughs> or to maybe add some more structure back to the conversation. Yeah, no, no problem. On page. <laughs> no, I think what was interesting is that there are, there are several, you know, issues that you're looking to address. But it sounds like generally when you look at the incoming class of, of associates, you're seeing that they're coming in already with uh, significant underrepresentation in terms of racial, um, yes. racial minorities are underrepresented, right? And so you see, you see that happening, but then you also see that even that 35% coming in is dwindling as you look higher and right. higher, right? And so it sounds like you're using these different areas of intervention, whether it's the looking at how billable hours can be increased, looking at how to hold people more accountable, senior leadership more accountable, um, how to help the associates build their managerial skills, right? You're doing all of these things to help address the fact that you wanna at least retain the people who come through the door in the very beginning. Is that fair to say? No, that's very fair to say. I think the other thing, and probably the last third pillar of, if you add, I think, what is it? I think accountability, which is really important. Mm -hmm. um, metrics being the second one. I think making sure, and I'm sure, I think this is this point is really pertinent when you look at actual industry. But how are you tying your DNI agenda to the bottom line, right? Yeah. That's so that's extremely important. So I think the ways in which we think about that is one: how do we cultivate the right external opportunities to I think maximize the profile of associates and, and put them in forums where they're getting additional business development competencies, business development exposure, client exposure, helping mm -hmm. maintain and kind of nourish the relationship with the client and helping senior lawyers see you in a different light. So it's not just, okay, this is the associate does my matters, but like, oh no, this is an associate that has a very powerful relationship with this, you know, very influential client, that mm -hmm. those types of levers are also, I think, very important, but also just leveraging the client relationship in general to maximize the diversity agenda as well. I think a lot of times, more than often, you see now that a lot of clients are, in terms of like the RFPs and like how you know firms compete for work amongst each other and filling out the RFPs, is that clients are now soliciting a lot of information on a law firm's demographic composition mm -hmm. at the associate level, at the senior lawyer level, within their leadership structures, mm -hmm. and then looking at the demographic composition within who has worked their matters historically and really trying to measure how, how committed is the firm and leveraging that as part of their decision-making apparatus as to how they allocate work to outside counsel as well. Mm -hmm. So that's an important lever, internal lever that you know, I can use to help advance the agenda internally because you know, once you can tie it to how it's affecting their pockets, you, know, you definitely get more you know, ambassadors and you definitely get more support to advance the conversations that's really important but also looking for collaborative opportunities with clients so whether it's within our affinity groups and the clients affinity groups looking for partnership opportunities looking for ways in which the clients can come in and see what we're doing on the dni front i think that's something that we've been personally very effective at at clary Gottlieb. we had these amazing heritage month celebrations where we bring in these very prominent and high profile speakers and we create a conversation about a DNI topic, particularly how it pertains to whether you're black, women, Asian, Hispanic, using those heritage month as the, as the anchor and really explore a conversation. A lot of times we talk about, I think, media and the underrepresentation of media 
multi of multicultural communities and media and how that informs ideas and perceptions about those communities to the larger global audience and how that manifests in the interactions in the workplace. That's something else that we've historically, we've historically done that has gained, I think, a lot of traction. Just to get, give you more of a sense of the types of speakers that we've had, Jadena, Oh, nice. Angela Rai, Yvonne Orji, Aquafina, Tanahasi Coates, Toronto Burke. So really, so really amazing, yeah. very high profile speakers. That, that has been really amazing, I think. It, we invite alumni of the firm. We consider people who've left the firm alumni. Mm -hmm. Alumni of the firm, you know, professional staff, all the lawyers, mm -hmm. pro law students who may be joining us for the summer, various pro bono partners. Other relevant high profile, I think, DNI practitioners or DNI ambassadors within the New York City legal industry. Mm -hmm. Average attendance is about 400 to 500 people. Just mm -hmm. having a really courageous conversation. And of course, the clients are there as well, right? Yeah. And it's an opportunity for them to really see that we're practicing what we preach. So, mm -hmm. for, and, and, you know, from the BD perspective, that's probably the most effective way. There's nothing, you know, I can definitely sell you the story on paper. And I can sell you it in metrics, but for you, for us to invite you into our home and for you to see the commitment manifest in real time is I think mm. the most powerful and impactful. So do, would you say that that event is something that you think of as part of your, it sounds like it definitely builds an inclusive culture, which is great. Absolutely. Do you also see it as part of your um, hiring strategy as well, just to make sure that people recognize that they can feel a part of your community and they will be seen when they come work for you? Absolutely. Oh, no, no, absolutely. I, you know, I hate to put this out there and hopefully this, I don't get any flack for this, but law students are the most unsophisticated consumers of employment opportunities. Let me tell you that. I will say it again. The law students are the most <laughs> unsophisticated consumers of employment opportunities. You know, like when we're in business school, we're weighing so many factors as to like how we decide whether it's the front reputation, opportunity, how it's going to position us for a long-term plan, the compensation, the connections, the network that will help expose you to. Right. Law students, just law students look at something they call the Vault 100, which is like the official ranking of the law firms, and that will help inform pretty much what they do. So having something like marquee programs like that that help yield a reputational dividends Mm -hmm. Definitely, that works wonders in terms of attracting a lot of people from the firm. And the firm, and the firm does have that reputation amongst ca campuses. That, you know that they say that, even though I think it's a bit paradoxical to say it, but I don't say it. They say it, that Clary Gottlieb is a, the HBCU among <laughs> the law That's firm, you know, the top law firms. It's a good, you know, it's a little problematic, but I, I, I appreciate it. I receive it, and I. I appreciate it. <laughs> I, think, I think what's great is that it seems that the work that you're doing is really bringing in that kind of reputation, like you're saying, right? And, but you also mentioned this, honestly, before we even pressed, you know, record and started this process, you were saying that this is an ongoing thing, DNI, it continues in perpetuity, you can't yeah. kind of, you know, rest on that reputation or on what people may think of, of the firm you have to keep going, right? And it sounds yeah, like what you're doing. No, absolutely. And identifying, you know, the right opportunities to keep the momentum moving forward, right? And, you know, I think a lot, of one topic, I think, in the legal industry that's gaining momentum is the idea of wellness and well-being and balance. I think probably more professional services will see that topic gaining momentum as, you know, the, millennia, the millennials come in, they start to usher, usher in a new era where they're, making the divides between work and personal very clear. <laughs> and that's just something that no matter how profitable your enterprise is, it's just going to have to learn how to adjust and accommodate that new workforce style. So that has a lot of traction right now and thinking about, okay, like what are the opportunities to think about intersecting DNI with wellness and like thinking about how do other communities think about wellness and making sure that whatever programmatic content that we have it's reflective of to it's reflective of the diversity of thought and ideas that we have within our community and making sure that every community can resonate with the wellness branding or whatever mental health initiative that we're putting out there so there's always new ground there's always new ground to break within diversity and inclusion that that makes it extremely exciting i agree and i think the other thing i mentioned this earlier that makes it really exciting is that 
you know, when you look at a multi-matrix organization like a Facebook or maybe even a Goldman Sachs is that when you're the diversity recruiting person, that's all you're doing, right? Like you just own the recruiting, but you don't really get the opportunity to see the whole life cycle. Like, okay, how does this recruiting, how's this work that I'm doing here? How's it manifesting in the professional development arena of the conversation or the corporate social responsibility aspect or the client relationship aspect? And within law firms, you really do get to own the holistic picture of DNI and really ensure that there's continuity in the voice and the approach. So that's one thing yeah. I also appreciate about the law firm DNI approach as well. That's awesome. You might be inspiring some people to consider doing DNI at law firms. <laughs> I hope so. I think it needs more. It definitely needs more people. Another thing, which is I think good, and it's good and bad sometimes. I think the other thing that's really interesting about DNI with law firms is that a lot of the practitioners were formerly practicing attorneys, mm-hmm. which is good to understand the perspective. But it's always good to bring in new skill sets into the profession. Right. I think. Like, that's how we started having more sophisticated conversations about data, right? Because that skill set started to gain more traction in the profession. So just to bring in, and I would love to see even more, and you see this to some extent, but you don't really see it in law firms. Like, I would love to see more organizational behavior professionals, like a lot of those PhDs, those industrial psychology PhDs and or psychology PhDs come into the profession too and kind of analyze and assess like this whole engine and kind of where the opportunities to really manifest DNI in these particular pockets of the institution as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping that the law firm DNI specifically gains more traction. That's exciting. I, I want to transition a little bit into um, kind of a, a tricky area. I want to hear about some challenges maybe that either to specific experiences that you've had or generally that you're facing in your role, anything that you're willing to share. I think it's always helpful to go through some of those challenges and to, no, no, absolutely. right? So if you can. My firm is a very polite firm. So, and I think that makes it more challenging because sometimes I think for me, I'm just a very forward person. And the more I think intentional and the more honest you're being, I think that allows, that creates a space for us to have that dialogue. My firm is polite. There's always going to be people who are reticent to the value that you bring as a DNI practitioner, because also expense, it has become a very expensive. You know, if you're going to do it right, it, it costs it, it costs a cute point. <laughs> it costs a cute point. So always being, you always have to be ready and positioning yourself to affirm your worth and to show your show your product, right? I think, you know, a lot of times, at least for me, I know it's one of the things that I often struggle with is that, you know, I always say in my head, I'm like, I'm not here to kind of self and promote myself. I'm here to self and promote these amazing lawyers that you hired Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to make sure that I'm holding every facet of this institution accountable to creating equitable experiences for them to make sure that they have the right opportunities that's going to position them to make out of their career what they want. Like, that is me. I'm not focused on, oh, how am I being strategic or leveraging this opportunity or this forum to self-promote my greatness or my brand or my success. But it is, it's important to strike that balance mm-hmm. because you want to be in a position where you're illustrating quantifiable metrics and that you can affirm and demonstrate your value at all times. Because mm-hmm. a lot of times with DNI practitioners, guess what? We're still minorities too. <laughs> a lot of time, you know, a lot of times. Mm-hmm. So we can get so caught up in I think, the work because there's so much passion behind the work that we forget that we need to be strategic about our own career as well. And I think the bureaucracy, the second challenge, I think, is the bureaucracy of it all. I, there's always going to be, if you're going to be a savvy DNI practitioner, you need to learn the politics of the organization that you're working mm-hmm. with. That to me is just as salient as any of the other things that I've said before. You really need to understand who the naysayers are, who are the people who have political capital, what's the, the people who have political capital, what's their agenda, what's the thing that makes them tick, and how you can align yourselves with them. So that is something that you can leverage moving forward. And you just need to be able to know, knowing the politics is also it's just how you're going to push out kind of initiatives and ideas. It's, it's just, it doesn't happen without it. Right. Um, so I think those are those are the challenges, right? I think yeah. being able to integrate yourself into really challenging politics when you're not 
a lot of time, well, for me, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an equity holder, right? Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily speak the language. I wasn't trained with the same orientation that they're trained with. So my approach to problem solving is different from their approach to problem solving. And how do I get us on the same page, right? Mm -hmm. That's always, that's a challenge specific, I think, to law firms. I think the first challenge about showing your value, that's specific to everyone. (laughs) Yep. So never get complacent that, so I guess the, the real takeaway is never get complacent that your organization has truly bought into d and mm-hmm. I think that's a great point, and you're right. I think it's definitely something a lot of people will find important to keep top of mind. I think as much as politics and understanding what that's like when you don't share the same background academically or the same professional experiences, I think that's also something that that I'm I'm hearing a lot from DNI professionals, where maybe their experiences are very centralized in diversity and inclusion, but they're managing engineers, for example. They're managing attorneys, for example. They're man- you know what I mean? Like there is an element of having to figure out how to speak the language when you have to, yeah. or how to manage that. So those are all great kind of pieces of of, of advice. Do you have any thoughts on if someone were to specifically try? to increase the, um, that, whole, that whole pipeline, uh, maybe pipeline isn't the right word, but what you mentioned before, where you have associates at a certain level, a certain amount of them, and then as things get more progressive, people start trickling out of the process. Do you have any kind of top line suggestions for how people can manage that challenge? Or what challenges have you seen in that realm that people can then maybe do something about? Oh, such an excellent question, and which is the million dollar, you know, I would have, I'd be rich if I could just answer that because the law firms would be paying me <laughs> lots of money to keep their pipeline, keep their pipeline <laughs> consistent throughout. To me, I think the issue, the first real issue is law firms specifically, they need to continue to sell the firm, right? Just as many, like you would be surprised the amount of resources that law firms expend to convince that convince law students that they are the best employer under God's green earth. And I think they just need to, KTSE, like Tiana Taylor said, keep the same energy. They have to keep the same energy. Because I think it's so much, it's so important, I think, for attorneys of color, I think any of the junior professional of color, to have that constant reaffirming. We constantly need to know like, okay, is this working or is this not? Like, how am I doing? And mm-hmm. a lot of times I think within law firms, like that's not the best skill set. You know, that we don't always do the best job of communicating kind of where lawyers are within their professional development or kind of reaffirming their value mm-hmm. and helping them be confident and self-assured in how they're traversing at the firm. So mm-hmm. I think we need to continue to sell the idea of partnership. I think that's, I think that's very important. Mm-hmm. You know, my thing is I'm focused on, I'm, I keep myself really focused on the experiences. And I think if you focus on the experiences and, you know, making people, making sure people are treated with respect, <laughs> then you can get people more focused in on, okay, can I see myself in a long-term position here? And what are the things that I need to start thinking critically about if that's something I see for myself? Uh, The other thing I think that's a macro level challenge, again, Mm -hmm. maybe a little bit provocative, more provocative content. Law schools don't do, are not doing their job. You know, as law schools, as a professional school, are not doing their job. Think about how much structured content you have in Warren to talk about professional development. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's the career services office and think about how much you use your career services offices or, you know, the specific clubs that focus on specific disciplines, whether it's consulting, okay. our finance, our social enterprises, you know, the informal forms, think about the curriculum and how that facilitates the conversation. Mm-hmm. Think about how professors could be a resource in that conversation. Just so many different your second year when you're a first year, your second years, you know, that element a little bit that element exists in law school. But there's so it's so embedded within the culture. And right. it's not just school, I think it's public health school, public policy school, social work school, education school, med school. They're so, it's so embedded within the culture and experience that you already are informed to, I think, think critically about what you hope to get out of the opportunity, right? I think mm-hmm. a lot of times miss, there's a lot of misinformation that's perpetuated, I think, 
in law schools often, and I think that helps people make, I think, the wrong, not the wrong decision, but they prejudge and they, they go into law firms saying, I'm only going to be here for three years. And I just mm-hmm. think that that is just not the right mindset because you've mm-hmm. already, you've self-selected yourself out of a race. I, even though that you don't think that you have, it's, it's something you completely have. And mm-hmm. as a minority, it's the first thing that you cannot afford to do. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they're going to say, oh, well, that person is not engaged. And yes, the DNI practitioner, I can challenge them on engagement, what that looks like, how that manifests across difference. Like, what does that word mean? Let me explain to you why that's problematic. And how about you now offer me specific examples of what this person should be doing to illustrate to you that they're committed, but let's not blanket it in engagement because that is not helpful and it's not constructive. Yes, I can get into all. I can do that. <laughs> it's my job to. It's my job to challenge. You know, challenge that type of rhetoric and challenge that type of discourse. But you're right, right? The person isn't engaged, <laughs> so that, <laughs> you know, just because I challenge it does not make them less right. You know, less right. Okay, you're and, right. <laughs> to go for you know for the associate now to then come in i think just with that mindset that they're going to be passive and just you know collect their check and look to do something else you mm-hmm. know i think I, I don't think i don't think that's the right mindset i think it's something that is challenging the pipeline as you as you framed before yes. um not having the right information um and then again, I think, you know, how do we build the right relationships, right? I think mentorship is important, sponsorship is important, but, you know, it's hard to get access to those things within law firms when you haven't proved your worth, right? So imagine, like, by year three, someone's like, oh, this person is really good, and now you want to give them attention, but they've kind of already decided that, I'm right. done. <laughs> That's so interesting, yeah. That's not really an answer, but these are the types of things that we need to Mm -hmm. getting into the weeds those are the things that we need to solve for in my opinion if we need to get to the pipeline of course there's being more communicative being better being more transparent with feedback um making sure that we have the right opportunities for the right people at the right times but all those things are very important but when you think about kind of the macro layers or the macro levers that are really driving some of the large pipeline issues Mm -hmm. you know i think that that's that's super helpful. I'm so glad that I asked that question because I, you know, you're giving us insight into I think a specific industry. This is the law firm space, which what I love about this work is that it's so cross functional. So it, it can be applied across industries, and people are thinking about how to leverage our skill set in DNI. But when you get into a different organization, you go to an industry maybe you're not as familiar with, um, I imagine it probably took you a little bit of time to see, oh, huh, like this is a, this is something I should tap into. And I love that you're offering that perspective. Do you have any kind of parting words of wisdom that you'd like to share, uh, assuming there are people who are listening, who are interested in this work, who care deeply about it, and are always, like all of us, seeking resources or advice? Do you have anything to share? No be intentional. You know, be, I think be very intentional with your industry. I think that's, I was, and I think that was the thing that made me successful in landing the opportunity. I think even from positioning, your, think about yourself in the interview, like what are you separating yourself from other DNI practitioners? Like, well, how much do you know? You, and I think the only thing that you could use to separate yourself to the extent that you got the interview is really knowing the backdrop of what you're going to be operating against. To me, I think that's the most, I think that's the most important thing for anyone looking to do this work. I think it has to be deeper than just wanting to do DNI. It's like, where do you want to do it? And knowing why you wanted to do it there and really making sure that you thought critically about the systemic challenges within that particular industry and DNI the specific challenges within that specific institution in DNI mm-hmm. and just making sure that you can bridge all those pieces together. I think it's really important. Awesome. I couldn't have said it better. Thank you so much, DeAndre. It was great having you. I hope on. this was helpful. I hope I wasn't too all over the place. I, I tried to be structured as possible. Or at least <laughs> <laughs> great. All right. Well, we'll um, have to make sure we get back to you and see how you're doing maybe in a little while. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Enjoy.